Hello, very good evening everyone and welcome to Untamed Beyond Boundaries. I'm Kang Hui and with me, I'm Li Fei. We are science educators from Science Center Singapore and we will host you this evening's podcast. So what is Untamed, you may ask? Untamed was born out of Science Center's ambition to redefine guest experiences amid this pandemic. So leveraging on a multi-dimensional approach to spark curiosity and self-learning, both on ground and online. So this broadcast is part of the Untamed Conversations, where we will be conversing with many of our special guests about wild and wacky topics around science, technology, engineering, and math. So in short, STEM. Also, to celebrate this in Untamed, we will be giving out two prizes, probably sponsored by the US Embassy. All you need to do is to share about your Untamed experiences on your social media pages, hashtag UntamedSG. So you will stand a chance to win these prizes, stay tuned. So in today's Untamed conversation on Artemis, we are very happy to have Mr. Slate Peters from NASA Exploration Ground Systems team to share with us on the next big program by NASA. Slate Peters grew up on a small family dairy farm in Midville, Pennsylvania. For the last four years, Slate has been helping to lead the NASA land and recovery team with the US Navy to develop plans and procedures to recover the Orion capsule off the coast of California and ensure it will be successfully transported back to KSC for all future Artemis missions. So let's welcome Slate. Hi, thank, thank you guys for having me. Hi, right, so Slate, would you, would you be able to tell us some story about yourself? Oh, absolutely. So uh, my name is Slade Peters, as, as they mentioned. Um, I grew up on a small dairy farm in Pennsylvania. I went to school actually at the Penn State University. I graduated with a degree in agricultural and biological engineering and specialized in power machinery and hydraulics, which is big off-road heavy equipment. Um, from there, I started right out of college at NASA as a propulsion engineer, um, and then gradually worked my way up from the engineering level to um, I became a NASA test director, helping plan all our integrated test and launch operations. And then from there, I moved into the landing and recovery team, which I am in now. Um, I started as the deputy recovery director overseeing all landing and recovery operations. Now I'm the ground ops manager in charge of loading the ship and making sure we get the capsule offloaded off the ship and then back across the country to Kennedy Space Center. Wow. Okay, so thank you Slate for your uh, self-introduction. So now actually I have a burning question for you. So uh, between the year 1969 and 1972, there were about uh, 12 astronauts that have been to the moon. But uh, I also heard that there will be exciting missions to the moon as well, sending uh, also the first female astronaut. Uh, my question is, uh, what has happened between uh, that period uh, after 1972 um, there wasn't much going on. So can you tell us a bit more about that? Absolutely. That's a great question. So um, we finished sending astronauts to the moon in 1972. Um, from there, we transitioned into the space shuttle program for the next 30 years. And really what we did there was to go into low Earth, or low Earth orbit for uh, longer duration missions, like two, three, four weeks at a time, um, to understand how we live in space and work in space for longer durations. And then actually towards the end of the shuttle program, we built the International Space Station, which is orbiting the Earth right now about 325, 330 miles up. Um, and it consistently has six astronauts on board. Um, and they are constantly living up there for three to six months at a time, um, looking at how to, how to work in space, how to live in space, um, and how we do some of the things like grow plants and other things that we'll need to do for some of the longer duration missions going back to the moon and Mars and beyond. So, uh, Slate, would you be able to tell us more about this Artemis program? Where, where is NASA going to land on the moon this time around? And what are the astronauts' objectives when they get there? So, uh, once we get to the moon, we're going to land at the South Pole, uh, and it will um, we're, we're actually going to land there for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of the main reasons is it has more sunlight than the equator. Um, so we'll actually be able to get power for our systems. Um, 
and be able to to do things more. Uh, also, it it's right in the point between um, the areas where we have the eternal peaks of darkness and the the eternal darkness. Um, so we can kind of do have the astronauts do different things in those different points to figure out if there's water and and other volatiles on the moon and how we go. Uh, pull those things out and, and potentially how we can use them not just to live on the moon but also learn how to live on Mars and uh, on Mars and how to how to get from the gateway to Mars in the future. Wow, that sounds like an exciting adventure for the future astronauts. So uh, right now I'm going to check in with the audience. So I believe those who are tuning in with us, you have a lot of questions for our guests. So you may put your posts, uh, your questions in the comment section and we'll get back to you very shortly. So do stay tuned. Right. Now, now we've met some children at the observatory who are really, really into space exploration and they read tons about NASA's spacecraft. Slate, would you be able to share with our audience, possibly NASA fans out there, what spacecraft would NASA be using for the Artis mission and What's so special about that, about them? Yeah, so uh, so the spacecraft that we're actually using, um, the way NASA is built with our manned spaceflight program right now, um, I am part of the Exploration Ground Systems Program. So here at Kennedy Space Center, where we do all of the the integrated test, the buildup of the rocket launch and recovery operations. Um, we have the Space Launch System, which will actually be the largest rocket that's ever been built. Um, and flown that we're actually going to launch the first mission of ne late next year. Um, and then on the SLS, we also have the Orion capsule, which sits at the top of the rocket, and it will hold up to four astronauts. Um, and once we get the Orion capsule into or orbit, we can actually um, connect it to lunar landers and some of the other pieces to be able to go to the moon um, and, and actually learn how to live on the moon, which we'll do for the first Artemis 1, Artemis 2, and Artemis 3 missions. Wow, so very interesting introduction on that. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about the uh, systems that has been set up uh, in order to achieve that? Yep, so, um, so uh, some of the systems that we work with here at the, at the Kennedy Space Center um, we actually have the, the vehicle assembly building, which is one of the largest buildings by volume actually in the world. Um, you could fit three and a half Empire State buildings inside it. Um, you can also fit about 250 billion ping pong balls inside. Wait, hold on, Slate. Did I hear you correctly? 250 billion ping pong balls? Yes, sir. 250 oh, no. billion. I, I love ping pong a lot and I think I will be literally smashing the balls for years. My goodness, 250 billion people. Okay, sorry, I got distracted. Slate, back to you. Nope, no problem. Um, so the vehicle assembly building, uh, it, it actually has uh, four bays where we can build rockets. Um, we build the rockets inside that building, uh, and then we do all a, a bunch of testing on the rockets from everything from the comm system to the hydraulic systems and, and, and everything in between to make sure all the systems work. Um, from there, we have the mobile launcher where the rocket sits. Um, and, and the crawler transporter is actually a big transport vehicle that we use and have been using for the last 50 years. Um, it actually rolls in under the mobile launcher with the launch vehicle on it and has the ability to pick the entire stack up and then roll it out to the launch pad. Um, that crawler transporter and the mobile launcher and vehicle together weigh uh, about 25 million pounds. Um, and when it rolls to the launch pad, it actually rolls out at about one mile an hour, which is blazingly fast. <laughs> oh, that is super fast, I believe. Um, so right now, uh, I'll take some questions from the audience. Uh, we have a question by Pei Eng Gan. He asked, or she asked, when did you get interested in NASA uh, programs? So that's a great question. So it actually started on the farm when I was growing up. Uh, my mom and dad would take us out and, and watch meteor showers and, and see planets and other things with telescopes in the backyard on the farm late at night. Um, and, and that was really, I think, one of the coolest things we, we, we really got to do, as well as we'd take time, even if we were busy doing farm work and things outside to come in the house and, and 
and watch shuttle launches and other things on TV for 10 or 15 minutes, no matter how busy we were. Um, and, and I think it really inspired me to to take notice of NASA and, and really want to go do that work when when I got to the age I was able to do it. All right. Uh, thank you for the uh, answers. I hope that answered your question. And now we'll take one more question from the audience. Uh, this question is by and you. Uh, if you if everything floats in space, how do astronauts bathe and go to the toilet on spaceships? I think that is a very very important question. Going to the bathroom. <laughs> it is a very important question. Um, so when when they do baths on the space station and in in orbit. Um, they, they don't take a shower like we do on Earth because the water goes everywhere. Um, really what they do is they use kind of wet rags and wet towels um, and, and they just kind of scrub themselves uh, to keep themselves clean. And then as far as the, the bathroom goes, so it, it's really uh, tubes and uh, smaller versions of, of uh, a toilet that we have on site. And they actually use a vacuum, a vacuum system to kind of evacuate it out and then uh, it, they collect it and, and and for research once we get back to see kind of what what change if it, what if anything changes while they're on orbit. Okay, so uh, maybe we'll take one last question uh, because there are a lot of questions coming in. We want to try to answer as much as we can. I'll uh, do keep the questions coming in uh, and we'll try to answer them in the later part of the show. So one of these questions is: um, Is it being is it uh, hard being an astronaut? Like what kind of training you go through, or is that uh, uh, as such? So the astronaut training is very involved. Uh, it combines a combination of physical training as well as uh, they go through survival training in the event that we have aborts or other things that get them into areas where they're they're not supposed to be after a launch or a landing. Um, they also go through almost two to two and a half years for each mission of training through. Uh, the vehicle systems and the mission they're going to do, whether it's to the moon or space station or wherever they're going to go to make sure they know all the all the things they have to go do. And really, it's, it, it helps them get kind of the muscle memory and and get everything down to a science. So once they're up there, if they have issues or concerns, um, it, it's easier for them to work back with Houston and and kind of work through the any of those issues they may have and and kind of get keep things rolling on schedule. All right, uh, thank you, Slade, for answering those questions. And uh, I hope that answers your question um, to our audience, Lim Han Ming. Okay, so audience, keep the questions coming. And now, back to Slade. So Slade, uh, you, so, uh, you have talked about the systems. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about the launch site or, and as well as the uh, uh, lightning protectors. I'm very curious about those uh, sure. things in place. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, so once we once we get the launch pad or the mobile launcher and the launch vehicle out to the launch pad, um, that's when we start working on our final test preps uh, before we get into launch countdown, and then we actually go into um, the launch countdown sequence. So while we're at the launch pad, um, it, it's actually surrounded by three 600 foot lightning towers that protect the vehicle and the pad surface. Um, those towers are designed to direct lightning away from the launch pad because Kennedy Space Center actually is, um, is, is pretty prone to lightning during the summer months. So we built those towers to make sure it keeps away from the vehicle and we can keep it safe while it's out at the launch pad. Um, from there, uh, from there we, we go into our launch countdown and our preparations. Uh, we load the vehicle with fuel and we get everything, all the comm systems and everything, final checks to make sure they work. Um, and then we also have a very extensive list of weather criteria that we have to meet before we actually are able to launch. Um, that's everything from making sure the winds aren't too high, uh, making sure there's no lightning in the area so uh, the vehicle actually doesn't get struck while it's going up the hill. Um, and also looking at other things like rainstorms and things that, that could potentially uh, hamper our visibility of the vehicle as it's going into orbit as well. Okay, so regarding lightning, actually, I have one more question for you. Oh, that's my personal question. Oh, has any like uh, space shuttle or rocket, has, uh, has it been, ever been struck by lightning, even when the, the, uh, there are lightning towers there to protect it? So uh, Apollo 12 actually was on, on the way up. Um, 
and the astronauts, because of their extensive training, were able to go through, uh, get the computers back online and, and uh, get through the mission successfully. Um, and, and that's really one of the reasons why we have the lightning towers and why we make sure we have our weather criteria in place before we launch, because um, we definitely do not want a vehicle to get struck by lightning um, and, and put the astronauts in danger as they're going as they're going up into space. Um, so we, we do spend a lot of time working on that weather criteria. And, and Charlie Blackwell Thompson is our launch director and actually our first female launch director. Um, and she is working with the team today to to kind of put that that whole launch infrastructure together and, and get it ready for when we launch next year with Artemis One, the very first mission. All right, so uh, Slip, perhaps you can tell us a bit more about what's next, especially this Artemis mission that you mentioned. Yeah, you mentioned Artemis One, and so there's uh, two, three, until, uh, well, what's it up to? So, um, so the Artemis missions are, are planned to go for the next uh, 20 to 30 years. Um, so Artemis One will go next year. That is our unmanned test flight to the moon to make sure all the systems work before we actually put astronauts and flight crew on board. Artemis Two will then have the first uh, flight crew on it and it will go to the moon, um, go around the moon to, to check everything out um, before we actually land on the moon. And then Artemis Three will actually be uh, the first the first lunar landing since uh, the last Apollo mission. Um, and it will be the the first female astronaut to step foot on the moon, as well as the next um, American male astronaut to land on the moon. So we're going through some very uh, exciting times here. And then once we get past Artemis three, um, we're we're at the point where we'll start launching about once a year after that, and and, and keep moving. Okay, so uh, Slade. Um, there's an interesting question from the viewer, uh, Seth Chinoy asks, why is it named Artemis? Why is the mission named Artemis? So the mission is named Artemis. Um, so Apollo actually had a twin sister uh, named Artemis. So the, the, the logical choice for naming of the, the next mission to the moon after Apollo uh, was, was to name it Artemis after Apollo's twin sister in Greek mythology. So, so that's that's where the Artemis mission name came from, and and I believe it's very fitting as well because uh, Artemis will be the mission that puts the first female astronaut on the moon as well. So, it's a it's a very cool thing. Yeah, it is. Now um, we also have another question from our audience. Is that uh, I'm also wondering, for us to go to the moon, right? Uh, how much fuel would the rocket need in order to do this? So uh, the rocket needs uh, quite a bit of fuel. Um, we actually load it with uh, hundreds of pounds of hydrazine and um, in the, the crew capsule and the upper stage engine itself. Um, that's for, for use when it's on orbit. And then the launch vehicle itself, um, we actually are talking uh, millions of pounds of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen that that actually fill the orange uh, core stage tank um, that get it to uh, up into orbit. And then we've also got the two uh, white solid rocket boosters, which um, are are four to five million pounds, um, and, and those. Uh, so all those systems together are kind of what help propel it up into into orbit. Okay, so I'm actually very curious right now. So if it's uh, sent to space, then what about its recovery back to, uh, to Earth? How is that done? That's a great question. Um, so if we want to, there we go. All right. So uh, the recovery. And this is near and dear to my heart because this is what I've done for the last four years. Um, really, the way recovery works, and if we want to go to the next slide and show the video. So this video is of our Exploration Flight Test 1, which was our, our flight test of the Orion capsule back in 2014. Um, really, what happens when the capsule comes back from the moon is it'll come back and enter the atmosphere, um, going somewhere between 17 and 20,000 miles an hour. Um, so as it comes back through the atmosphere, we have a series of 
um, drogue parachutes and then main parachutes that will deploy to help slow it down. Um, the three main parachutes that deploy actually, when you lay them out, would, would cover the size of an American football field. Um, but really what those do is they slow the capsule down to about 60 miles an hour before it hits the water. Um, and, and that not only protects the spacecraft as it comes down and hits the water, uh, but it also helps reduce the, the G loads and the forces on the astronauts um, once they're inside coming back as well. Uh, once it gets in the water, um, the parachutes are cut away by some automated systems built into the flight vehicle. And then our recovery team actually goes out to the capsule with the US Navy um, and, and we send out a team of U.S. Navy divers. Um, they go check the capsule, make sure there's not any hazardous materials or, or anything leaking. Um, and then they go actually connect to the capsule. And then we actually pull it into the back of what's called a well deck ship. Um, and, and the well deck ships in the U.S. Navy are ships that are built to actually submerge. Um, they can put anywhere from a foot to uh, up to 12 feet or more of water in the back of the ship. So essentially the way we get the capsule back for the, the Artemis missions is uh, the ship will sink into the water about six feet. We'll float the capsule in over a cradle and then the ship ballasts and lifts itself back up out of the water and we actually set the, the capsule down um, on that cradle. And then once we get it down and, and locked in place, uh, they'll come back into port and then we'll get it ready, put it on a truck and send it back to Kennedy Space Center to do all the necessary tests and inspections we have to do to make sure we're ready to fly um, each mission after that. Okay, uh, I actually have another question to ask, uh, it's a personal question. Um, regarding the design of the recovery capsule, uh, I saw there are a lot of airbags around it. Uh, is it possible for the recovery to do away with the parachute and just have a lot of airbags to cushion the fall? So um, part of the reason that we, we use the parachutes um, is because it's going 17,000 miles an hour. Um, we need those three parachutes to kind of slow it down. Um, but once you get it slowed down, uh, there, there are different ways that you can, you can uh, protect the vehicle as it uh, gets close to the ground. Um, we, we use the parachutes to kind of help slow it down and actually land in the water, which is a little softer landing. Um, we do have some of our commercial partners like Boeing um, who are actually sending our astronauts up to the International Space Station. Um, they actually land on land and actually do have airbags on the bottom of their capsule that deploy um, after the main parachutes do and as it kind of hits the ground to help cushion the capsule and the, the flight crew inside the vehicle as well. So, so there are different ways to to kind of slow it down and, and protect the vehicle and the astronauts as they as they come down and, and touch down, whether it's in the water or on on land. Okay, um, looking at through at the questions from the audience, uh, thank you, audience, for submitting your questions through the Facebook comments. Uh, do to keep them coming. Uh, there are a lot of actually a lot of interesting questions, and uh, perhaps I'll just pick this uh, regarding the moon. So uh, this question from Virena. Why does NASA want to launch another rocket to the moon? Since you have already done that, why another mission to the moon? So that, that's another great question. So the, the main reason that we're going back to the moon um, is really to learn how we live on another planet long term. Uh, so, so our plan at this point is to, is to go back to the moon and actually build a habitat there um, that we can put astronauts on and, and potentially learn how to live long term. And, and part of the reason we want to learn how to live like that on the moon first um, is because if, if we have issues or concerns on the moon um, with that habitat, it, we, we have a, a couple days that we can get the astronauts back on to uh, a spacecraft and get them back to Earth. Um, but also, we're, once we learn how to um, live on the moon the best way possible for extended periods, that's going to help us as we go to Mars, uh, because with today's rocket technology, um, we essentially have to use a combination of propulsion and orbital mechanics when the planets align to be able to get from Earth and the moon to Mars and back. So essentially, you're looking at about a two to two and a half year trip for the astronauts uh, once they leave Earth to get to the Mars and before they're able to come back. So we really want to try to focus on the moon and figure out how to live there and 
and sustain life and do the things we need to do, like uh, growing plants and, and learning how to survive. So when we send the astronauts on those long journeys, um, we make sure they're safe while they're out there and we can get them back safely uh, when the planets realign and we can get uh, everything moving again. Well, you know, talking about plants, right? Um, there's a question much earlier on that we received from Jun Lee is that what kind of plants have you man have we managed to grow successfully during our mission on ISS? So uh, I, I don't know what kind of plants we have grown specifically. Um, I do know that the the astronauts on the space station today are currently growing um, dozens of different kinds um, and, and learning how to do it with uh, hydroponics and some of the other other systems that are up there. Um, but uh, I, I can definitely get that answer and on what we've grown and, and get that back to you. Okay, thank you, Slade. Uh, I think maybe you can tell us a bit more about the plans for Artemis because you, when you rename it, uh, or rather when you name it Artemis 1, I believe there'll be Artemis 2, there'll be Artemis 3, and so on. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about the plans uh, on that. Okay, yep. Okay, so uh, so I, as I mentioned, Artemis 1 is the first unmanned test mission to really go check out all the systems and make sure the vehicle performs like it's supposed to before we put the first flight crew in it. Um, about, uh, about a year and a half to two years later, uh, we'll, we'll launch Artemis 2, which will be the first crewed mission, um, and it will go out to the moon, around the moon, um, verify everything, and, and kind of scout out the moon and the landing, uh, landing spots. Um, and then come back. And then Artemis 3, which is scheduled to occur in 2024, um, will actually be the mission where we put the first female astronaut and the next uh, male astronaut on the moon um, to really start uh, to really start honing in on on how we do the the long term duration living on the moon uh, and and also try to figure out what kind of volatiles are there and and how we would be able to get like water and other things out of out of soil, not just on the moon, but also on the Mars once we get there and and test out some of those technologies that we're going to have to use to go to Mars and beyond eventually. Okay, so uh, actually I have a question from the audience that seems uh, related. Uh, Lim Han Ming again, um, he asked, because you are testing uh, a lot of things out uh, for Artemis mission one and two, uh, he asked, how long does it take to send a message from ISS to Earth. Uh, if you were to do that for the moon, how long will it take as well? So actually one of the, one of the reasons that we picked the South Pole on the moon is because we'll have constant communication uh, from the Earth to the moon. Um, and it, 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 it actually is, is uh, pretty, pretty quick to get the, the messages back. Um, again, I don't know exactly the, the time frame. Um, but we're talking uh, minutes, not hours. So, uh, um, it, it, yeah, it's it's pretty pretty quick, and, and it'll be good because we'll have direct communication once they're at the South Pole on the landing site. Oh, that's great to hear. You will just receive messages uh, within minutes. So, I uh, I believe you will communicate with family members. You'll be quick. It will not take yep. days or hours. Oh, that's good. Um, then uh, let's look at another some other questions that the audience might have. Um, still regarding astronauts, uh, I think everyone is curious to become an astronaut. That's why they ask all these questions. So, uh, said Chino again, uh, do astronauts have mobile phones and do they play the games during the free time? Uh, that, is, uh, that is a question I don't know. I, I don't believe they take mobile phones onto the space station with them. Um, uh, but they but they do uh, because they they are quite busy while they're up there, um, so so their all their time while they're up there is spent uh, doing doing the mission operations, um, and they also have an IP phone uh, built into the space station that they can use to to call family back and forth. Uh, but usually in their downtime, um, they're they're sleeping, exercising. Um, and and also on Twitter and Facebook, a lot of times you'll see the astronauts that are on the space station have um, shared photos and videos of kind of the pictures they're taking out of some of the windows and portholes on the station of Earth and and of some of the other very cool phenomena they see up there. So 
they're very busy. Um, they don't uh, they, they don't have a lot of time to play games. But okay, so uh, audi uh, audience, please, uh, younger audience especially, so study hard, play Astro games, so that you can become an astronaut. <laughs> Uh, some of us might be wondering, right? Uh, you know, is it only being an astronaut to be part of NASA space programs? What what other career opportunities would we have in order to to join uh, the space programs? So, so that's a great question. If we want to go to the next line, okay. So, so at NASA, we have, we have all kinds of different positions. Um, we have everything from welding technicians and, and our technicians that, that work on the launch vehicle um, from integrated testing all the way to the launch pad to uh, marketing and, and human resources folks to doctors, lawyers. Um, you have engineering of all kinds, whether it's chemical, biological, um, mechanical, electrical. Um, we also have food scientists. We have astronauts. We have a very wide range of, of opportunities. Um, and, and one of the things that I always love to tell students uh, around the country and around the world is that um, as long as you work hard, um, you work hard, you study hard, and and, and you have the motivation to, uh, to, to get there, um, we have many opportunities to, to get to work, not just in NASA, but, but also with NASA. Um, we also have international fellowships uh, that we have folks from all over the world helping us develop launch vehicles and, and come up with mission objectives. We also have a lot of industry partners uh, that help us build build the launch vehicles and, and a lot of the mission objectives, not just in the U.S., but also around the world. So there's many different ways, uh, if you, it, but if you work hard, study hard, and and, and kind of follow your dreams uh they they can really take you anywhere and i'm i'm proof of that going from a dairy farm to to being a nasa ground ops manager today so well uh, i hope the audience get inspired by uh, uh slate's uh, motivation quote so study hard no matter where you come from uh, if you put your mind to it you'll achieve it okay all right so actually we don't really have time to play games right now, no matter whether you are you are inclined to the arts or inclined to science, okay, you always have opportunity to work on a space program, right? So uh, we are we have rather um, quite many questions for you, Slate, okay, and it seems okay. like we have some um, some people who are really very interested into into what you like, okay. Yeah, I mean, we, we get these uh, questions very much as well. What is your favorite planet? My favorite planet. Uh, so I, honestly, I, I would probably have to say my my favorite planet is uh, Jupiter. And, and, and really, that's um, a part of that is because um, it's the largest planet, but also uh, because I've always wondered what it be, would be like to be on Jupiter with uh, the higher gravity that it has, um, and, and to wonder if, if you were actually able to stand on Jupiter, um, what would it feel like and how would you be able to walk around and move around because with the gravity as big as it is, uh, that'd be a, an interesting challenge to kind of work through and, and, and figure out how you could survive there, so. Okay, uh, on that topic, uh, I'd like to tell my colleagues uh, my favorite planet uh, my favorite planet is actually Jupiter. Uh, sorry, it's actually Saturn. And uh, I like to uh, uh, say that uh, this planet uh, Saturn represents my wife. And why is that? Because I would like to put a ring on her. Or I put a ring on the planet Saturn. <laughs> yeah. that, that's that's, a, that's a great reason. <laughs> so I think, well, after Mars, we have Jupiter. Right? Then we have Saturn. So is that, is that the... Is that uh, a path where NASA missions can be planned around? So um, for the long-term planning, um, really the way we're set up right now is uh, where the decree is that we're going to put uh, people back on the moon uh, on 2024. Um, we're still planning to get to Mars by the mid-2030s, by like 2035 or so. 
Um, and once we get to Mars, we're going to figure out, again, long term, how we kind of live there in habitat. Um, in between those lunar and Mars missions, we've got a bunch of other missions that will launch with SLS um, that will go to places such as like uh, Europa, uh, the moon, um, to, to kind of go see uh, what it's like and, and what the what the conditions are there um, and some of those other robotic type exploration missions really to go out and gather that information and, and kind of inform us on once we get to Mars and know how to live there, kind of where that next long-term destination is going to be. So, so it all, it all kind of leads into that um, NASA always and, and, and kind of the human exploration spirit always wanting to go further than we've begun before and explore and see where we can go and, and what we can do. So, Mars is definitely not going to be the stopping stopping point. Um, it, the moon and Mars is really the kind of the starting point to see where we can go further and farther. Okay, so uh, let's say uh, the missions on Mars, we always see Mars rovers, uh, pictures of Mars rovers. Uh, is there a possibility that, uh, or has there already been um, drones that were used on these exploration unmanned missions? Um, so aside from aside from the the rovers that are up there, um, and we actually do use the rovers uh, as drones. Um, we we drive and operate them from here on Earth. Um, I, I I don't believe we have actually used uh, flying drones anywhere else. Um, but but like I said, we uh, we are getting ready actually to send another another Mars rover to Mars, um, and it, it will hopefully be there next year sometime um, to, to kind of replace the, the science laboratory and, and start getting more in-depth information about Mars and the atmosphere and, and the soil and Earth and, and kind of where some of the good places would be to eventually land there in the 2030s as well. Okay, so uh, thank you for your answers, Slade. And uh, let me just uh, let us just read through more comments from the audience because the, it, we are really flooded with questions. We're trying to um, check through uh, how many of them are repeats and how many new ones are there. Uh, you know, uh, talking about Mars, right? We, we've we've seen the movie Martian, okay, and we also talked about it a little bit um some time back. We we're wondering, is it? possible that we that NASA would plan a team or is it even possible for anybody to be stranded on Mar on Mars then what would what would we do then if somebody is really stranded on Mars so if, if somebody was really stranded on Mars um, it, it would it would probably in real life actually be fairly realistic to to the Martian um, we would be working 24 seven here on the ground to make sure we get a rescue crew and, and launch vehicle ready to go. Um, and in concert with that, the, the astronaut or astronauts that were stranded on Mars, um, they go through that long period of training and, uh, before each mission. So, so they, they go through not just all the kind of the nominal, everything goes well. And, and here's how we react to, to those situations, but they also go through, a lot of contingency and survival training. Um, so, so they would have that, that training like uh, you saw with Matt Damon in The Martian that um, they really would have some of the abilities to, to kind of survive and, and keep going until we were able to get, get crews back up there. But that's the other reason why we're working hard to, to perfect uh, some of the ways like to grow plants and, and produce water and, and other things using the the resources that we have on the moon and Mars so that they'll be able to do that and and we have contingency time for them to survive while we get potentially get a rescue crew up there if we have to. Okay, uh, Li Fei, maybe we take one last question from the audience. Yeah, you know, um, I think some audience also have the burning question of uh, or maybe two burning questions because you mentioned about uh, the training that they received, right? Now, I, I will, I will, uh, so the questions that come to our mind very often is how long does it take for the astronauts to train and also how long does it take for a spacecraft we built from scratch to the point that they can be launched? 
So uh, it it can take uh, a, a large amount of time. So um, for like for the SLS rocket and and the Orion capsule, um, we've actually been been building the Orion capsule in some shape or form for the last uh, about ten years, um, and that's really designing it and, and making sure we have everything uh, designed and built to the specifications to to make sure it can do all the mission capabilities. And then um, that also goes into actually building the flight hardware itself um, and getting it ready. And, and then once once you get through kind of that design and development phase, then once we get the vehicle at Kennedy Space Center, it takes us anywhere from uh, about six months to a year to actually get it all integrated and put together and tested and ready for launch. Um, and, and the variability there from six months to a year is for a rocket like Artemis One, where it's a first-time rocket, uh, we may have a few more issues or problems that come up from a first-time build of the rocket that we have to go kind of troubleshoot and work through. Um, so it may take us a little longer to do those first couple. But then once we get into like Artemis Three, Four, and Five, where we're doing them once a year, um, typically those those problems and issues during build uh, kind of ramp down, and we're actually able to start processing more quickly. So. Um, the, the initial phase usually takes a little longer, but once you get in and get operational, it, it usually starts moving along pretty good. Okay, so perhaps we um, uh, end off with one last uh, very personal question. Uh, Slate, have you been to space or and will you be interested to go to space? So the first part of that question is no, I have never been to space. Um, if, if they would let me go to space, I would go in a heartbeat. <laughs> Absolutely. Why? Why would you want to go to space? I would love to go to space as well to, to see the uh, the stars. Uh, but what about yourself? So I, I would love to go to space for all of it. I mean, it, it would be very cool to be able to see the Earth from that kind of uh, celestial position. It'd be very cool, like you mentioned, to see the stars and and, and kind of the whole universe from that as well um and really honestly I, I would love to be at zero g and be able to flip around and do things like you see in the astronaut videos as well so i just think it'd be fun all the way around okay thank you slate and uh i think uh, that's all for tonight uh thank you everyone for tuning in to our uh, podcast and remember to hashtag untamedsg in your social media post uh, names of all the lucky winners will be posted on our untamed Facebook page. So keep a lookout for that. And all these are kindly sponsored by the US Embassy. And with that, thank you and remember when it comes to STEM, nothing is beyond boundaries. Thank you everybody and good night. <laughs>